First off, I would like to start by thanking the Griswold Center for Economic Policy for granting me the opportunity to present my thesis and work at the Undergraduate Student Research Forum. It is an honor to be recognized in this respect, and I am grateful for this opportunity. Additionally, I would like to thank my advisor, Professor Orly Ashenfelter, for all the help he's given me throughout the research process and for nominating my work to the Griswold Center. Lastly, I want to quickly thank Dana Molina for her consistent aid throughout the pro this process. Although, if the global circumstances were different, I may have been afforded the opportunity to present my thesis in person, and with that, meet and network with a great variety of scholars, but regardless, it is great to be able to share my work and thoughts through an alternative means. I prepared a few slides to help in some of the analysis and points I will discuss. My thesis was titled, Development and Common Ownership, How Intra-Industry Diversified Shareholders Can Create Anti-Competition in the Airline Industry. Basic economic theory supports the idea and rationale of industry-wide competition, as it is both in beneficial to the consumers and the firms undertaking such processes. In today's economy, in addition to considering their own interests, many firms must also consider shareholder value, i.e. the value enjoyed by each of their shareholders, and in a lot of cases, this is the ultimate measure of a company's success. If, per se, although this is not the case, if uh, each firm in a competing industry was owned by distinctly different shareholders, then acting in accordance to one shareholder is seemingly quite practical. But in today's economy, in a term we've seen in the past, this is not the case. In the recent decades, the share of stock in U.S. publicly traded companies that is partially owned by institutional investors has increased substantially. And because of this, many natural competitors are owned by a small set of large institutional investors. This is what I refer to as intra-industry diversified shareholders. This common ownership implicitly changes the objective function of firm managers, as they now must consider that some of their largest shareholders also have ownership rights in their competitors. As mentioned before, in terms of competition, the ideal practices of traditional price undercutting becomes complicated when your shareholders are also sh own shares in your competitors. Picture this purposely gener uh, generalized and simplified scenario. Imagine an industry with two equal size firms, firm A and firm B. Suppose A undercuts B's price to attract customers from B and thus gain market share. Firm A may benefit from such a move by selling many more units of a product at a slightly reduced price. However, A's gain in market share comes at the expense of firm B's loss in market share, and average prices in the market are lower. As a result, the owner or owners of firm B lose more revenue than the owner or owner of firm A gains. Ultimately, the sum of A's and B's profit falls compared to their profit prior to firm A's undercut. Considering an investor holding equal size stakes in both A and B, i.e. this shareholder is intra-industry diversified, the movement of the sale from firm B to firm A simply moves this investor's money or profit from one pocket to, the, to another. The net effect of this price cut is that both firms charge a lower price, thus lowering the owner's profit across both firms. In sum, an investor holding equal size stakes in both A and B would enjoy greater total profits if the two firms set prices or quantities as if they were two divisions of a monopoly instead of two independent firms. The research question of my paper was to see if common ownership in the airline industry, that provided through intra-industry diversified shareholder shares, displayed anti-competitive effects between firms in said industry. I paired previous economic theory and literature in this field with the distinct empirical evidence to illustrate a reduced form relationship between a modified market concentration in index, that which takes into account common ownership, and markups of firms in the airline industry. Recently, the implication of stock acquisitions and horizontal shareholding in an industry has gained traction. With law in the legal field being of interest in mine, I knew I wanted to focus my thesis to be applicable in the legal context. Professor Ashenfelter prompted me to delve into papers that dealt with, both empirically and theoretically, common ownership. The aim of my paper was to utilize existing theories, the main one coming from authors Daniel O'Brien and Stephen Salop, to provide justification for analysis and complement this with an empirical analysis that modifies a recent paper by authors Jose Azar, Martin Schmalz, and Isabel Teku. Authors O'Brien and Salop construct a modified herpendahl hirschman Index, MHHHI. They establish that if HHI, the traditional market concentration, accurately measures the likelihood of anti-competitive effects from completely separate ownership, econom economic modeling of firms competing a la Cornat indicates how to calculate MHHI's 
that measure the likelihood of anti-competitive effects in a way that takes into account partial ownership overlaps among horizontal rivals. Authors Jose Azar, Martin Schmalz, and Isabel Taku utilize the MHHI index constructed by O'Brien and Sal and apply it to the airline industry. The basic assumption of this paper and this theory is that intra-industry diversified shareholders are more likely to prefer managers who maximize industry profits by avoiding competition. This contention is rather intuitive if there is one single investor in the entire industry. But what I aim to aim to examine is, how does commoner ownership of smaller, more realistic percentages reduce competition? I believe, after conducting my research and putting forth empirical evidence, that these smaller percentages must be considered by antitrust regulators when monitoring stock acquisitions with regard to relevant legislation. The two main antitrust legislative regulations are the Clayton Act, Section 7, and the DOJ FTC 2010 Horizontal Merger Guidelines. Although the Clayton Act is noted predominantly in the case of mergers, it can be extended much further and is applicable in the case of stock acquisitions. This act essentially relates to the assumption that institutional investors, acquisition of firms aligned horizontally in an industry, can likely reduce the incentive for these firms to compete when these acquisitions produce an increase in industry-wide comp- uh, industry common ownership, which is measured by MHHI. Additionally, in the same vein, the DOJ FTC horizontal merger guidelines addresses critical numerical figures in regard to the Her- Herfindahl Hirschman Index, HHI, that later put this paper's findings in regard to the modified version into perspective. One crucial aspect of common ownership, and one that many critics use to refute its ability to soften market competition, is this idea of a passive investor, which, according to the Clayton Act, may be exempt from its ap- applicability. I will touch on this a bit later when I just discuss the policy implications. But in sum, a goal of mine was to substantiate the claim that, regardless of a passive investment strategy, the mere quantity of ownership that is held across an industry by different shareholders could lessen competition if, perhaps, it simply lessens the incentive of, of the firms to compete with each other, even though the investor never uses their stock to affirmatively influence business conducts. Now that I have hopefully laid out an appropriate framework for understanding the implication of common ownership and how the relevant literature and legislation can be applied in this context, I will now discuss the data I used to construct the MHHI index and additionally the empirical models that follow. The traditional HHI calculation, which the DOJ uses as a point of reference, considers simply the sum of market share squared in an industry. The MHHI index, which is displayed on slide three, Extend, extends the explanatory ability of the HHI index and considers three main variables in its calculation, shareholder ownership, shareholder control, and market share. My analysis was conducted on a quarterly basis between 2010 and 2019. In order to calculate the market share of the U.S. publicly traded airlines, I used the Euromonitor database. In terms of shareholder data, I used the 13F filings compiled from the Thomson Reuters Spectrum data set. The data set includes all U.S. holdings of publicly traded firms by institutional investors. The set includes information on the number of shares that are sole voting shares, share voting shares, and no voting shares. The table on slide four sheds some light on the extent of common ownership in the airline industry in 2011 quarter one. My entire analysis, I limited ownership to just the top 10 shareholders in each quarter. Lastly, the outcome variable that I analyzed was markup, which I defined as gross profit divided by cost in a given quarter. I used CompuSat Fundamentals Quarterly North America for this accounting data. This markup reflects the variable used by authors of Brian and Sal in their Cornot model of competition. Nine airline companies have varying levels of gross profit across the years. The heterogeneity, as shown on slide four, in the markups of companies required me and some of my analysis to utilize fixed and random effects. The table displayed on the prior slide gives a sense of the degree to which the airline industry is commonly owned, but it does not quantify the extent to which these companies are connected. So, after compiling all the necessary data, the next step was to construct the MHHI index. This was undoubtedly the most difficult process of the paper. As shown in the equation displayed, this index is a matrix that involves interacting a shareholder's ownership and control across all airlines. Ownership was calculated as the percentage of all shares while control was calculated as the percentage of sole voting shares and share voting shares. I constructed two different calculations of MHHI, 
the original as replicated from previous literature, and one that assumed proportional control, which meant that ownership and control were equal, and the type of shares, voting or not, was not considered. Both calculations rendered similar results, and I will refrain from delving into the implications of that comparison. Most of the regressions that I used, the HHI index was included as a control variable. I hypothesized, in sum, that the MHHI would be positively related to markups, i.e., when there is more common ownership in a given quarter, the markups of firms included in that quarter would be higher, assuming this markup change was generated from a price increase, one that aimed to serve the interests of the intra-industry diversified shareholders. If MHHI does not capture an important part of shareholder incentives, as reflected through a firm's markups, or if frictions are seemingly present that prevent the implementation of shareholders' anti-competitive incentives, empirical tests would have supported the null hypothesis that common ownership concentration, as measured by MHHI Delta, has no effect on markups of firms. If, on the other hand, economic incentives, as captured by MHHI, explain economic outcomes reflected by markups in some form, then the alternative hypothesis would have found support. That is, common ownership by diversified investors, as measured by MHHI Delta, has a positive effect on the markups of firms. After documenting the variation in MHHI and HHI to establish the MHHI Delta, I began my analysis with a comparison between MHHI and HHI. As shown on slide 7, the HHI level remained quite constant throughout, while the MHHI changed quite distinctly and was much higher. According to the U.S. Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission horizontal merger guidelines, in highly concentrated markets, markets with an HHI greater than 2,500, a merger raises significant competitive concerns if it produced a change in HHI between 100 and 200. Additionally, quote, mergers resulting in highly concentrated markets that involve an increase in the HHI of more than 200 points will be presumed likely to enhance market power, end quote. On average, the HHI was above the 2,500 highly concentrated market threshold. So, to put these numbers in perspective, if we modify these specifications to the context of the MHHI delta rather than just the HHI, a change in the MHHI delta of 2,297 into 2010 quarter one, to 4,344, the average level, implies increases in concentration that are over 10 times higher than the threshold that raises antitrust concerns. Given the MHHI and MHHI delta values displayed, it is evident that in the airline industry, common ownership links are present. But despite this, there are still reasons why anti-competitive incentives, those arising from common ownership, might not be implemented. In this case, the MHHI would not be a better indicator for the variation in markups in the airline industry. I conducted four regressions to test the robustness of both the MHHI and HHI separately and to see which one was a better index for capturing the outcome variable of markups. Overall, the findings in this analysis show that the relationship between concentration and markups is much stronger and more robust when concentration is measured using MHHI. When interpreting the coefficients on the concentration indices, it is better and provides for a more causal interpretation when you regress the outcome variable on both the HHI and MHHI simultaneously, and using the HHI as a control. The baseline analysis I conducted served to quantify the relationship between common ownership and markups while controlling for HHI. In a simple scatter plot between the MHHI delta and markups, the positive correlation between MHHI delta and average markups was made evident. I complemented this with two baseline regressions that used average markup and industry total markup as the dependent variables. For these equations, 3A and 3B, company markups were either average or aggregated. The results implied that an increase in MHHI delta from its minimum to average value is associated with an increase in the average markup in the airline industry of 44.21% and an increase in the industry total markup of 35%. This is shown through the coefficient values of 0.000216 and 0.000171. Since, as mentioned earlier, the markups at the company level were quite distinct from that of another company, it was important to examine how each airline specifically was impacted. Ultimately, according to the framework and theory proposed, although some companies may have been able to soften market competition as the presence of horizontal shares increased, the less powerful companies, i.e. the ones with less market share, likely saw a less profound impact on the variations in their markups.
Given that, I aim to provide an additional test in the robustness of the reduced form relationship between common ownership and markups. I conducted four regressions, two at the company-specific level and two at the pairing-specific level. In regards to the latter, the MHHI matrix cal calculation was constructed based on firm pairings, i.e., the ownership con and control of, say, shareholder I in firm J was interacted with their ownership and control in firm K. With that being said, I was able to deduce a formula that I denoted as MHHI delta addition, which signified each pairing's contribution to the overall MHHI delta in that quarter. In other words, this represented the extent to which two firms were connected through common owner common shareholders rather than how connected the entire industry was. Equation 4 illustrated a large and statistically significant positive effect on MHA de delta and markups. The coefficient of 0. 0.000197 in the first specification with random effects implies that an increase in MHHI delta from its minimum to its average value is associated with an increase in the markup of a company in the airline industry of 40.32%. Next, I moved to a more specified approach to look at each company specifically. I ran a company-specific regression of markups on MHHI Delta and HHI for each company specifically. Equation 5 showed that five of the companies showed positive and statistically significant relationships, and four of the companies with the highest market share had positive coefficients, and all but one rendered statistical significance at the 0.05 level. Moving on to the analysis of pairings, after constructing the MHHI, HHI delta addition equation discussed earlier, I aim to quantify how each pairing's contribution to the overall MHHI delta impacted their respective markup. I ran a fixed effect regression of the pairing markups, which was just the average between the two companies, on MHHI delta addition and HHI. Equation 6a rendered a large and statistically significant effect of the MHHI delta addition between pairings and the markups between pairings. The coefficient of 0. 0.000618 on MHHI Delta addition implies that an increase in MHHI delta addition from its minimum to average value is associated with an increase of 22.33% in the markups of the airline pairings. Similar to the second specification I mentioned in regard to the company-specific analysis, that being equation 5, I conducted a pairing-specific regression in order to better analyze how each pairing was, was, affected, was affected by their quarterly addition to overall MHHI delta specifically. Equation 7 showed that eight total pairings displayed results that rendered a positive and significant effect of M The goal of this paper was to combine previous economic literature and theory on common ownership with a newly developed empirical approach to investigate whether shares held by intra-industry diversified shareholders create anti-competitive impacts, starting with O'Brien and Salve's derivation of the modified herfindahl hirschman Index, where they developed a model in which this index can be derived from a Cournot model of competition where firm managers attempt to maximize the weighted average of their shareholders' interests. The extent to which airline companies were connected based on their shareholders was quantified. Using MHHI delta, which is the difference between MHHI and HHI as a reduced form measurement of common ownership, the following empirical question was addressed. Does common ownership, as measured by MHHI, have explanatory power for the markups of firms after controlling for the traditional market concentration index, HHI? Unlike any of the literature before, this paper is the first to study that considers the markups within a specific industry as the outcome variable to denote the monopolistic behavior resulting from horizontal shareholding. Chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, confirmed that following an acquisition of, ma of major stakes in the airline industry in 2016, he or the holding company held between 7 and 8.5 percent in the major airlines. CNBC's Becky Quick, in an interview in February following that year, confronts Beth Buffett in this regard and asks, quote, you know, Warren, it does occur to me, though, if you're building up such a significant stake in all the major players, is that anything that's like monopolistic behavior? Is there any concern to think, to think that you would say something to the airlines to make them make sure that they're not competing on prices quite the same? What would keep somebody from worrying about that? End quote. Buffer responds expectedly by recognizing that he's a passive investor, and by definition is one that does not participate in the daily decisions to run the companies that he holds shares in. In the same interview, when asked about being a passive investor, in regard to his potential concern with Berkshire's Hathaway's increased stake in the air airline industry, potentially causing anti-competition, Buffer responds, quote, oh yeah, totally, totally, end quote. Since him and many other CEOs of institutional investing firms merely make investments and are not actively influencing the decision-making processes of management, anti-competition based on stock acquisitions is seemingly, seemingly to them of little concern.
This paper shows that regardless of whether or not institutional investors' horizontal stack acquisitions were purely passive, these horizontal shareholdings raised the markups in the airline industry. Given that, these acquisitions are subject to challenge under the Clayton Act, Clayton Act and are not negated through the passive investor exception. If robust, my paper's findings raise several questions about passive investors, antitrust regulation, and legislation regarding common ownership through horizontal shareholding. Ultimately, this thesis combines an application of previous theory with empirical results to challenge their traditional economic assumption that firms' fundamental objective, objective is to maximize their own profit. My paper makes a claim that shareholders may not agree with the profit maximization strategy of firms when they act as price takers, i.e. in their own self-interest. Shown through an empirical application of O'Brien and Salop's derivation of MHHI, the objective of the firm implicitly changes based on the incentives and interests of their largest shareholders. For policymakers, considering the competitive risks of common ownership is no easy feat. Although the literature on common ownership has increased substantially over recent years, the legal consideration given to this development by U.S. antitrust agencies is just beginning to gain traction. According to Bloomberg Law, the Federal Trade Commission signaled its interest in this, in this subject at the end of 2019. Director of the FTC Office of Policy Planning, Bilal Saeed, said during a speech at Georgetown University Law Center that antitrust law, quote, recognizes that minority ownership and cross-ownership, ownership stakes in competing company, can have anti-competitive consequences, end quote. After noting the empirical literature done in the airline and banking industry, he notes that although the conclusions in this development are so variable, they are placing, quote, a high priority on determining the merits of this position and any of the proposed remedies, end quote. U.S. antitrust agencies have made it clear that studying the competitive impact of common ownership is a priority, but as the economic research continues, the debate remains in its initial stages. In terms of what needs to be considered, two implications of common ownership are clear. One, effective market concentration measures must consider both the number of firms in their market shares, i.e. HHI, but also the extent to which these firms are commonly owned. And two, since consolidation in the asset management industry contributes greatly to common ownership, further consolidation in the financial sector should be evaluated through a lens that recognizes the ramifications on product markets. Moving forward, proposing policies that are beneficial to all parties is quite challenging. Something I refer to as the shareholder trilemma illustrates this difficulty in terms of the three goals that can't be simultaneously achieved. One, perfect shareholder diversification. Two, firm maximization of shareholder interest. And three, preservation of competitive product market markets. Referring to the figure on the slide, in order to have perfect shareholder diversification while maximizing shareholder interest, markets can't be fully competitive. In order to have fully competitive markets and perfect shareholder diversification, then firm managers cannot include the interests of their shareholders in their objective function. Lastly, in order to have fully competitive markets and a maximization of shareholder interests, shareholders will not be perfectly diversified. In sum, the optimal trade-off between these three goals is a highly debated and contentious topic that antitrust regulators and economics in the field must consider. Lastly, while my paper does not propose a specific solution for the trilemma, any policy propositions that are considered in regards to the anti-competitive incentives of common ownership must weigh the potential benefits to shareholders against the potential loss to consumers. To conclude, I argue that when firms implement shareholders' incentives and all shareholders, including those with significant control, are fully diversified, product market competition will tend towards monopolistic outcomes with an associated deadweight loss for the economy. Moving forward, it would be interesting to extend this analysis to other sectors and industries to see how general the results are. Thank you for this opportunity. I really enjoyed preparing this presentation. If any viewers have questions, comments, or want to reach out, I would love to hear from you. Additionally, if this development is of interest to you, I would be more than willing to discuss it further. My contact information is on this slide. Thanks again. I would like to begin by thanking the members of the Griswold Center for Economic Policy Studies for selecting me for their undergraduate student research forum the center's associate director, Dana Molina, for her help in the creation of this presentation, and my advisor, Professor Leah Bustan, for her support and passion for my research. This presentation primarily highlights only the key findings, so I encourage those who would like to learn more or have questions to read my thesis, which is posted on the Griswold Center's website. Investigating the relationship between gun control laws and the gun death rate using machine learning methods, laws relating to background checks, criminal history, and domestic violence matter.
Gun violence claimed 39,426 lives in the United States in 2019. In the same year, 38,800 Americans lost their lives to automobile accidents, and 34,200 were killed by influenza during the 2018-19 flu season. Over 60% of all firearm-related deaths in the U.S. have been suicides, 24,900 in 2019, and roughly half of all suicides in the U.S. are committed with a firearm. The high rate of gun violence in the U.S. is perhaps more disturbing when compared to that of other high-income countries. A clear reason for the difference in gun violence, however, derives from the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and the country's robust history with firearms. Thus, the historically limited role in countering gun violence has concentrated on preventing at-risk or dangerous individuals from having firearms. In 1999, after a nearly decade-long decline, the national gun death rate, GDR, plateaued at about 10.3 per 100,000 residents. It fluctuated between 10.0 and 10.4 through 2014. Yet, in 2015, the gun death rate rose to 11.1 to 11.8 the next year, and then to 12.0 the year after that. How can legislators reverse the trend seen in recent years and do so efficiently? Answer, focus on the laws that matter. This paper concerns state gun laws. Specifically, many of the laws relevant to the paper are federal laws, but state and local officials typically cannot enforce the prohibitions without analogous state laws. Thus, gun policy in the U.S. is generally decentralized. The heterogeneity and preferences for varying degrees of gun regulations across the country provides an opportunity for cross-state analysis. As seen in the plot, the number of laws followed has steadily increased over time, while the gun death rate plateaued and even rose in recent years. This suggests that legislators' efforts might not necessarily be working. Thus, the goal of the paper is to study which gun control laws are meaningfully related to changes in the gun death rate and to provide potential evidence for appropriate changes to gun policy. Overall, most of the existing literature focuses on individual laws, specific categories of laws, or measures of gun ownership. I take a distinct approach from the literature, however, by not disciplining my question from the beginning. These studies establish associations between fire mortality and specific gun control laws, but they generally do not look at the big picture. There are hundreds of laws at the national and state level, each related in some way or another, either from the region of effect, the time of passage, or in some other manner. Performing such analysis under the scope of a single law or class of laws is far too narrow in breadth, given that we know state laws are often passed in packages. Additionally, the study extends analysis to areas of gun control seldom covered in the literature, like domestic violence-related laws. Overall, the study's minimal hypothesis approach allows the data to determine which laws are associated with gun violence without any preconceived biases of their predicted importance. What is the relationship between a given gun control law and the gun death rate in the context of all other laws? And are certain categories of laws better predictors than others? As a note, the categories of laws studied follow. Background checks, criminal history, domestic violence, drugs and alcohol, mental illness, minimum age, permitting process, and miscellaneous. I then explore whether the effects of a given law on the gun death rate change with the machine learning methodology and pay closer attention to laws that have consistent results across specifications. Finally, I perform the same analysis, but replace the gun death rate with the overall suicide rate. This is chosen in favor of the firearm suicide rate to control for substitution effects to other instruments of suicide. I consider 1,428 observations, each pertaining to a distinct state and year, New Jersey 2012, for example, along with 102 law indicator variables. I begin with a fixed effects analysis where I control for state and year fixed effects and state-specific linear and nonlinear time trends. The nonlinear time trend is excluded from machine learning estimation. This paper analyzes high-dimensional data where the number of variables is large relative to the number of observations. There are 1,428 observations and 102 law variables, plus a fix of X terms, where large does not require the number of covariates to be greater than or equal to the number of observations. Instead of selecting controls the traditional way, imposing subjective biases onto the model, the lasso estimator selects optimal controls with respect to the law indicator of interest. 102 unique models are run, each with a different law as the indicator of interest. 
in the XBO equation. Y is the gun death rate. D is the law indicator of interest, one of the possible 102. Tau times T is the state-specific linear time trend, and XIT is the set of possible controls, every law indicator minus the chosen regressor of interest, along with the state fixed effects and year fixed effects. Optimal controls are independently selected for each model. Random forests do not provide coefficients, instead selecting features, covariates, that predict changes in the gun death rate. This methodology is employed partly to corroborate fixed effects and SPO lasso results. I measure the importance of each law feature by the total decrease in known impurity. This is obtained by splitting on feature K and is averaged across all decision trees in the forest. It is important to note that selective features may not have a causal relationship with the outcome, but instead may be highly correlated with another variable in the model, which does have a causal relationship with the outcome. This is a common feature of the data set, given that many related laws are passed at the same time. Sixteen gun control laws had statistically significant coefficients at the 5% level or higher. Laws 1, 19, 24, and 31 have consistent and significant results across all sophisticated specifications. Take Law 1. Is a criminal background check required for the sale of all firearms, as opposed to only the sale of handguns? Consider Model 5. The interpretation on the coefficient of minus 1.94 is that these states would, on average, see its gun death rate fall by 1.94 points if it did not follow the law, but then passed it. This interpretation is the same throughout the fixed effects and XBO lasso analysis. Law 19. Does state law disqualify people from getting concealed carry permits based on other criminal history, where other is non-misdemeanor um, convictions? The coefficient on Law 19 corresponds to a 1.831 point decrease in the gun death rate in Model 5, and a roughly 1.64 point decrease in the gun death rate in Model 6. Law 24. Does state law require all people under final domestic violence restraining orders to turn in their firearms when they become prohibited from having them? The coefficients on Law 24 are significant in Model 5 and 6, where the effect of enforcing this law corresponds with a 1.404 and 1.171 decrease in the gun death rate. Law 31 asks, does state law disqualify people with convictions for abusing their boyfriends and girlfriends from carrying concealed guns in public? The coefficients on Law 31 are significant at the 1% level in Model 6, where the effect of enforcing this law corresponds with a 4.51 point decrease in the gun death rate, the strongest average treatment effect seen this far. These effects have a causal interpretation assuming that all potential confounders are time invariant or captured in either a national trend or state-specific trend. Again, the lasso specifications are the most sophisticated, so the coefficient should be given the most weight. The context. Law 4 asks, do any exceptions apply to the background check requirement? Law 5. Are background checks required for all sales by unlicensed sellers doing businesses at gun shows? Law 8. Are there penalties for a buyer who fails to follow the background check law? The coefficients on the background check laws, laws 4, 5, and 8, suggest that the passing of this type of law corresponds to declines in the gun death rate. The gun show loophole law, law 5, corresponds to a 1.929 point decrease in the gun death rate. The results are similarly promising with regards to law 4 and 8. Law 19 is one of a handful of laws that is significant across all specifications as discussed earlier. Machine learning estimation supports inferences drawn from the traditional fixed effects regressions. Law 21, a domestic violence law, asks, does state law require abusers convicted of domestic violence misdemeanors to turn in their firearms when they come prohibited from having them? Law 27 asks, and states that do not prohibit firearm possession by all people under temporary domestic violence restraining orders, does state law explicitly allow judges at their discretion to prohibit people under these orders? Law 28 asks, does state law require all people under temporary domestic violence restraining orders to turn in their firearms when they become prohibited from having them? Law 29 asks, and states that do not require all people under temporary domestic violence restraining orders to turn in their firearms, does state law explicitly allow judges at their discretion to turn to order these people to turn in their firearms? The XP Lasso model produces strong evidence that passing domestic violence restraining related gun control laws above all other categories of laws is the most important thing to the aim of lowering the gun death rate. Specifically, passing these laws is, is associated with declines in the gun death rate. The following law indicators coefficients correspond to an X point decreases in the gun death rate. Law 21 to a 1.041 point decrease. 
Law 27 to a 1.867 point decrease, Law 28 to a 3.199 point decrease, and Law 29 to a 2.307 point decrease. Inference can be drawn confidently on each coefficient given that this group of laws is generally weakly correlated, unlike the case with background check laws. Overall, the drawn inferences assume that the state fix effects, national time trend, and state specific trends control for a substantial portion of the effects of confounding variables. If these assumptions are correct, the estimated relationships are causal. Nonetheless, this paper produces strong evidence that the passage of laws related to background checks, criminal history partially, and domestic violence especially will correspond to declines in the gun death rate. Regularization techniques, dimension reduction namely, increase model flexibility and thus out of sample application. Generally, random force is used to validate results from prior models. Every law feature in the above table relates to either background checks, criminal history, or domestic violence. These three categories have consistently been the most important across law specifications. This is further evidence that policymakers should look first to these categories of laws if the goal is to change the gun death rate. This also suggests that laws themselves are the most important drivers of the gun death rate, despite significant differences in the gun death rate across states. The features Year State 1 and Year State 8 refer to the state-specific time trends of Alaska and D.C., respectively. Intuitively, these inclusions are expected given how dramatically D.C.'s gun death rate trended throughout the observation period. These six gun control laws will be the focus of discussion because each law falls under one of the consistently important categories of background checks, criminal history, or domestic violence, and the coefficient on each of these laws is either newly significant under the XBO lasso specification or has a similar coefficient, significance, and direction as under Model 5. The background check laws, Laws 7 and 8, correspond to a 1.612 point and a 2.294 point decreases, respectively, in the suicide rate. The correlation between Law 7 and 8 equals 58%, much lower than the correlation between most other background check related laws. So, the indicators could affect the suicide rate largely independent of one another. On that note, it is important to remember that Law 8 is highly correlated with Law 0, 98%, Law 4, 97%, Law 5, 91%, and Law 9, 98%. Thus, evidence suggests that mandating background check laws in many forums corresponds to estimated declines in the suicide rate much like the way in which these enforcements correspond to estimated declines in the gun death rate. Law 19 is again the most consistently significant law in the data set, with its coefficient corresponding to a 2.467 point decrease in the suicide rate. The domestic violence related laws, laws 20, 29, and 30, correspond to 0 0.79 point, 1.566 point, and 1.251 point decreases respectively in the suicide rate. Non-concealed carry domestic violence laws largely correspond to declines in most of the gun death rate and suicide rate, particularly under an XPO lasso framework. In conclusion, if legislators aim to lower the gun death rate and or suicide rate by passing gun control laws, they should direct resources towards passing laws related to background checks, criminal history, and especially domestic violence. An important direction of future research to consider derives from Knight 2011, where the author considers cross-state externalities associated with state gun control laws, notably discovering that illegal gun trafficking is responsive to state laws. The contraband flows from states with weak laws to those with strong laws. The critical insight here for this paper is that the passage of a law in state one may have less of an effect if the surrounding states do not follow that law. Therefore, the gun death rate or suicide rate in, say, New Jersey, is not only a function of its own gun control laws, but also whether the same laws are enforced in nearby states. Suppose Law 5, the gun show loophole, is causally and negatively related to the gun death rate. If it is open in both New Jersey and Pennsylvania, the effect of closing it in New Jersey on New Jersey's gun death rate would presumably be stronger if Pennsylvania also closed the loophole. This paper does not consider these cross-state effects. An area of future research could involve implementing Knight's insights into this paper's framework to see if the results changed. ETR sub-questions additionally provide a direction of future research. Many of the studied 102 gun control laws have sub-questions. For example, Law 24 has 23 sub-questions, ranging from with whom can the person store the gun, law enforcement, license dealer, third party, to does the state law apply not only to intimate partners under final domestic violence restraining orders, 
but also to abusive people restrained against their family members. An exhaustive analysis of the sub-questions of consistently significant laws like laws 8, 19, 24, and 29 will lend valuable insight into the associations established in this paper. I sincerely thank all of you for your valuable time and attention and wish you all the best. Hi, my name is Carlotta and I'm very pleased to present my senior thesis and its policy implications to you today. My senior thesis is about the macroeconomic effectiveness of unconventional monetary policy in the Eurozone, and I approach this topic using a structural vector autoregression. First off, I would like to give a huge thank you to my thesis advisor, Professor Christopher Sims, who provided me with unparalleled guidance throughout the process. Let me start by providing you with a quick background about my topic and why I think that unconventional monetary policy in the Eurozone is a worthy topic of study. The way in which major central banks and developed economies conduct monetary policy has drastically changed throughout the past decade, with unconventional monetary policy, which goes beyond the scope of traditional interest rate policy, having become more prevalent since the advent of the global financial crisis. This was also the case in the euro area, where the European Central Bank, the ECB, faced two major crises. First, the global financial crisis, and then the sovereign debt crisis which was followed by a period of sluggish growth and low inflation once the immediate threat of the crisis was over. However, the policy rate quickly neared the zero lower bound, which meant that interest rate cuts could no longer be used to stimulate the economy, and the ECB therefore turned to a host of other measures, including different non-standard liquidity and financing measures, and then later also forward guidance, a negative deposit rate, and a large-scale asset purchasing program, the APP, which was launched in 2015. Since these measures are so unprecedented, highly controversial, and they really make up the main monetary policy tool of the ECB throughout the last decade, their effectiveness is particularly important to study. And it's also important to study how their effectiveness has changed over time, which are both of the points that I address in my research questions. Analyzing the literature so far, the majority of it focuses on the financial market effects and the transmission channels of unconventional monetary policy in the Eurozone. These event studies have found that policy announcements led to a compression of yields and spread, a rise in equity prices, and a depreciation of the Euro. However, much more important for purposes of this study, the literature around the real effects on the macroeconomy is relatively scarce. And it is even more important in order to determine whether the ECB really fulfilled its policy goals. There are two main reasons for this relative scarcity. It is very difficult to disentangle unconventional monetary policy shocks from other cyclical shocks in the economy. And secondly, it is difficult to find a suitable measuring tool since the policy rate is no longer indicative of the central bank's monetary policy stance. And this means that there is no clear consensus on the macroeconomic effects in the euro area, which is generally quite understudied compared to the US and the UK. Therefore, I attempted to fill three main gaps that I identified in the literature as follows. First, I used a novel identification in my structural VAR, namely identification through heteroscedasticity that had not yet been used in the euro area macro study. And I here follow the framework by Brunnermeyer, Pallia, Sastry, and Sims, in their recent paper that I will explain later in this presentation. Secondly, I use data up to December 2019, being the first study, to my knowledge, that uses post-2016 data. This helps me incorporate lagged effects and also allows me to further split my sample to analyze certain time periods using a second identification method that applies sign and zero restrictions. And thirdly, I use the so-called shadow short rate as my unconventional monetary policy tool. The shadow short rate is denoted by the blue line on this chart, and it largely follows the policy rate, the MRO, which is denoted by the red line, until the global financial crisis in a period where conventional monetary policy was mainly used. However, once unconventional monetary policy enters the toolbox of the ECB, we see that the policy rate diverges from the shadow rate, and while the policy rate tends towards zero, the shadow rate becomes negative and continues to become negative in order to represent the policy stance from the ECB, even at the zero lower bound. And this makes it a very practical tool 
to measure unconventional monetary policy. As you can see in the chart, the shadow rate moves inversely to the shaded gray area, which represents total ECB assets, which usually also increase as a result of unconventional monetary policy. And lastly, this chart also reinforces how important it is to study the effectiveness of unconventional monetary policy, since the ECB's balance sheet has more than tripled since its inception. Next, let me turn to an overview of my methodology. In order to investigate the macroeconomic effects, I decided to follow other studies in running a Bayesian structural vector autoregression with five variables using data from 2009 to 2019, at least for my main model. I used the shadow rate as a policy tool, GDP, and a harmonized index of consumer prices as my macroeconomic variable, and then two financial market variables to help disentangle the unconventional no monetary policy shocks, namely the composite indicator of systemic stress and a money market spread between two different rates, the MRO and the overnight lending rate. Next, in order to identify my VAR, I use two different methods. The first, identification through heteroscedasticity, is based on the aforementioned Brunner-Meyer study, who uses it in a US macro study. It identifies the VAR based on the premise that the variance of structural shocks changes throughout different periods in the sample. Therefore, we can exogenously determine different variance regimes, which in my case is quite conveniently split towards the end of the euro crisis in mid-2013. The second identification used in this paper is the status quo in the literature. Here, we apply different sign and zero restrictions on the structural coefficients. Specifically, in our case, we apply a contemporaneous zero restriction on output and prices since the macroeconomic variables are only affected with a lag. And I apply sign restrictions on financial market variables, namely the shadow rate and the spread variable. For a more detailed description of my methodology, please refer to the re relevant section in my thesis. Focusing on identification through heteroscedasticity, the first important result for my research is that I was successfully able to obtain a contractionary monetary policy shock using this approach, which means that it is a useful method to use in the euro area. As you can see in the impulse responses on the slide, a contemporaneous rise in the shadow rate here is associated with a zero impact on output and prices. Over time, however, output declines gradually and significantly over the 60-month horizon, while the effect on prices is less clear. Systemic stress and the spread variable both rise as expected. It therefore suggests that unconventional monetary policy was successful in stimulating output overall from 2009 to 2019. Since my results using identification through heteroscedasticity are in line with the literature and make economic sense, we can conclude that this identification method is suitable for future policy-related research in the euro area. It is particularly notable that we managed to produce these results without imposing any strict short or long-run restrictions on the structural coefficients. Next, let me turn to my more explicit policy recommendations obtained when dissecting the two different variance regimes specified for the previous identification method further. Using sign and zero restrictions, I analyzed the time varying effectiveness of unconventional monetary policy in crisis times, as denoted by the red, and in non-crisis times, as denoted by the blue. My findings are very interesting. First, looking at the systemic stress variable, we see non-overlapping error bands right here. And from this, we can conclude that unconventional monetary policy was more successful in reducing financial stress in the first sub-period when the Eurozone combated the two immediate crises than in the second time period. The effect on output, however, was significantly higher, as you can see here with the non-overlapping error bands, in the second sub-period while the impact on prices up here was negligible throughout. The results pictures on the slide also hold when we alter the break of the dates to solely focus on the APP program, the ECB's quantitative easing program that was first announced in late 2014. The findings that I just summarized have important policy implications for monetary policy in the Eurozone. Overall, 
ECB monetary policy has been successful in stimulating the economy since 2008, but it had different effects during crisis versus non-crisis times. According to our results, unconventional monetary policy is a useful tool to restore functionality and liquidity in financial markets in crisis times, as determined by the systemic stress indicator. However, during crisis times, the transmission mechanism to the real economy appears to have been impaired. Perhaps this is related to the fact that the ECB, unlike the Fed and the Bank of England, is often criticized to have done too little too late, indicating that it should have adopted a more aggressive and rapid response rather than its more gradual approach to achieve policy goals during crisis. In addition, monetary policy alone might not be sufficient to reach policy goals. On top of monetary policy, the monetary union should find a more direct way to drive aggregate demand, such as perhaps a fiscal union, allowing for the pooling of a centralized budget with a solidarity mechanism when a crisis takes hold, which would be particularly useful if the crisis is as asymmetric as the sovereign debt crisis was. In non-crisis times, on the other hand, unconventional monetary policy was more successful in driving output. One potential reason for this could be related to the restructuring of the Eurozone's financial system to be less bank-centric to make it more capital markets driven in the aftermath of the crisis, which was a good step in the right direction. On a more negative side, however, we have to conclude that the APP launch in 2015 was not successful in stimulating prices. Therefore, the Eurozone needs to find a more effective and sustainable solution to fulfill its price sustainability goals and the large scale asset purchases might not be worth it, especially given their controversy. To conclude, it makes sense to look into the relevance of the study for the future. In terms of COVID-19 and the economic impacts of the current pandemic, it is clear that the ECB will have to continue to take an active role in helping to build confidence and liquidity during this demand and supply side crisis. The very aggressive and rapid pandemic emergency purchase program from March exceeds all its previous purchases, which appears to be a good start given that the ECB reacted too late and too little to the last crisis. Similarly, a pan-European fiscal response is a vital complement to unconventional monetary policy given that the transmission mechanism of monetary policy appear to have been broken in the last crisis. From an empirical perspective, there are multiple extensions of my study that I hope to pursue in the future or hope that someone else will. Given that the area studied is a currency union, it would be incredibly important to analyze the cross-country heterogeneity of unconventional monetary policy effectiveness. Next, it would be really interesting to observe how the transmission channels changed over time and how this may have impacted the time-varying effectiveness that I found evidence of in my study. And lastly, from a method methodological point of view, I hope my study can inspire future euro area policy studies, not limited to monetary policy, to use identification through heteroscedasticity as an identification method in a structural VAR. Thank you so much for your time today and making it to the end of this presentation. Please refer to my thesis for additional information and my sources, and do not hesitate to email me with any further questions you might have. In my thesis, I examined the impact of vocational secondary education on student outcomes in the Dominican Republic and estimate the returns to public investment in vocational high school. The Dominican Republic has historically had one of the worst educational systems in the world, ranking 137 out of 144 countries in 2012. So when President Danilo Medina took office that year, he launched his educational revolution, which has overseen the largest expansion of school infrastructure in the Dominican Republic's history. The major axis of the educational revolution has been the increased focus on Politecnicos, which are vocational high schools that serve as the alternative to traditional academic high schools called liceos, and they enroll about 20% of high school students. Politecnicos allow students to concentrate in specific degrees, ranging from accounting to nursing to agriculture, and a lot of funding has been put behind Politecnicos, including construction of new ones and converting liceos into Politecnicos. But despite this new policy focus, neither the profiles of the students who attend Politecnicos nor the educational impact that Politecnicos have has been analyzed, and there's little empirical evidence surrounding the effectiveness of vocational high school in improving cognitive skills among students, especially in comparison to academic high school.
the varying conditions and nation specific institutions under which vocational training has been implemented, as well as the difficulty in eliminating selection bias for the students who self select and the vocational education has led to mixed conclusions. Literature analyzing the returns of vocational education in developing countries, particularly Latin America, is scarce and mostly non causal. So I broke up my empirical analysis in four main parts. First, I assess the profiles of students who select into vocational school over academic high school. Then I estimate the impact of attending a vocational versus academic high school on students' academic outcomes, including their years of high school attainment, probability of high school dropout, on-time graduation and graduation, 12th grade standardized test scores, probability of application and enrollment in college, and college application test scores. I subsequently estimate the heterogeneous impacts of attending vocational versus academic high school on student standardized test scores for various school and student profiles. Then, based on field work I conducted in the Dominican Republic, I qualitatively evaluate the organizational and educational inputs that differentiate vocational high schools and their performance in the context of decentralized school management. And finally, I estimate the returns to public investment in vocational high school over academic high school. So to accomplish these aims, I conduct analyses using student level longitudinal data on more than 700,000 students in the Dominican Republic. I ran an OLS and logic model to predict the enrollment choice of an individual student, controlling for their eighth grade GPA, eighth grade standardized test scores, their gender, the wealth quintile of their municipality, whether they attended a public middle school, whether the closest school to their middle school was a Bloy Technical, and the distance and distance squared from their middle school to the nearest Bloy Technical. Next, in order to determine the effects of attending Bloy Technicals versus lease sales on student outcomes, I conducted two stage least squares regression analysis. I instrument distance and distance squared from the student's middle school to the nearest Bloy Technical to eliminate selection bias in a student's decision to enroll in a Bloy Technical due to their distance from the school. My empirical strategy builds off of CARD's 1993 analysis, which uses variation in college proximity as an instrumental variable to estimate the returns to schooling. In proximity to a Bloy can serve as a legitimate instrument because it represents an exogenous determinant of a student's decision to enroll in a Bloy Technical, but it has no direct effect on the aforementioned academic outcomes. Like in my enrollment model, I control for student level and municipality level characteristics, and I limit my analyses to students who stayed at the same high school all four years. For the public expenditure piece, in order to examine the heterogeneous impact of attending Politecnicos in a given quintile of spending versus Liceos in a given quintile of spending on standardized scores, I connect the same two stage least squares regression analysis. To estimate the impact of within school change in average annual per capita transfer expenditures on school performance as measured by 12th grade standardized test scores, I use a multi-level mixed effects model. For my first model, I found students were more likely to enroll in a Bloy Technical if they were female, if they had higher eighth grade GPAs and higher eighth grade national test scores, and if they were from a municipality with a middle to low wealth quintile. A significant determinant of enrollment was distance. The farther a student was from a Bloy Technical, the least likely they were to enroll. If the closest school to a student was a Bloy Technical, they were 8.8 .8 percentage points more likely to enroll. This map shows a geographic distribution of Bloy Technicos and middle schools in the Dominican Republic. The red are middle schools and the green are Bloy Technicos. And as you can see, the Bloy Technicos are clustered in the major cities of Santo Domingo and Santiago, and they aren't as geographically dispersed as middle schools. Diving a bit more into availability and distance of Bloy Technicos, I have information on new Bloy Technicos that opened in 2013 and 2014 in my panel. And while where Bloy Technicos are being built might not be exogenous as they may be built in higher poverty areas in order to enhance access to education or in higher resource areas where government officials can lobby for increased educational investment, there is variation not only in the municipality wealth levels of existing Bloy Technicos, but in these Bloy Technicos constructed in 2013 and 2014. As figure nine shows, some of these Bloy Technicals were open and wealthier and educationally dense zones, such as in Santo Domingo. And within that three kilometer radius of the new Bloy Technical, there are 20 liceos and 26 middle schools. But as figure 10 illustrates, some of these Bloy Technicals were open in poorer areas with more limited coverage, such as in Neiva. Within the three kilometer radius of that new Bloy Technical, there's only one liceo and eight middle schools. So therefore, variation in Bloy Technical availability over time, conditional on the same poverty level, helps separately identify the role of of availability interacted with poverty for enrolling students. I find attending a Politecnico or vocational high school relative to academic high school boosts the average student's 12th grade standardized test scores by up to 0.4 standard deviations, increases the probability of on-time graduation and likelihood of college application, and boosts students' college admission scores by 0.3 standard deviations. And the magnitude of these boosts in standardized scores is on par with some of the top charter schools in the US.
This table illustrates the heterogeneous impacts of Politécnico on 12th grade standardized Spanish scores for different Politécnico and student profiles, and each cell is the output of a different regression. The Politécnico profiles include religious Politécnicos, which are associated with a religious order and given a greater degree of managerial autonomy, converting Politécnicos, meaning the school was a liceo undergoing the process of being converted to a Politécnico, Authorized Politécnicos, meaning it had the appropriate infrastructure, curriculum, and personnel to be deemed a Politécnico, and authorized religious Politécnicos. And I segmented students by gender, wealth quintile, academic achievement, and whether they attended a public or private middle school. Most notably, I identify substantially larger impacts for authorized and religious Politécnicos, as well as poorer and lower scoring male students. These more magnified impacts for lower scoring and poorer male students suggest these Politécnicos potentially address academic achievement inequalities. So I then turn to exploring the mechanisms that may explain Politécnicos greater effectiveness and the greater effectiveness of some of these profiles. So I conducted field work in the Dominican Republic where I surveyed a liceo and a range of Politécnicos varying in their achievement levels and their socioeconomic enrollment and public versus private diversity. I conducted 32 total interviews, principals, teachers, and adult students, and eight total classroom observations in five schools. I also interviewed nine policymakers and private sector individuals involved with Politécnico administration and education, including the Vice Minister of Education, the Minister of Economy, Planning, and Development, and the Director of the Educational Quality Assessment of the Ministry of Education. And from my field work, I identify five main organiz organizational and operational factors that have been empirically demonstrated to enhance efficiency and equity in educational systems and that contribute to Politécnico success. And these five are autonomous management, curriculum and classroom design, hiring practices and teacher quality, school climate, and student body composition. So diving into the public expenditure piece, creating these unique conditions for Politécnicos necessitates greater investment relative to liceos. Politécnico's total per capita expenditures are 1.5 times those of liceos. And I find for between sector impacts, money matters as Politécnicos in higher quintiles of spending significantly outperform liceos in higher quintiles of spending, while Politécnicos in lower quintiles of spending have no significant impact over liceos in lower quintiles of spending. But within schools, I find no significant relationship between increased annual per capita transfer expenditures amongst Politécnicos and school performance. And finally, I find that even though Politécnicos require greater investment, using a back of the envelope ca calculation, I find the academic benefits of an average Politécnicos impact on a student's 12th grade standardized test scores alone translates to a net present value of $500 per student. So my findings contribute to the slim literature on the causal impacts of vocational education in developing countries and suggest that the Dominican Republic strategy of investing in vocational education has increased human capital. Continuing to invest in vocational education, as well as adopting and implementing successful practices of Politécnicos throughout the country's educational system has the potential to yield high economic and social growth for the country. And I would like to mention and thank my advisor, Professor Nielsen and Professor Jennifer Jennings, who have been invaluable mentors throughout this whole process, which began with my GP. And I'm also thankful for the economics department and all the support and tools as professors have provided me with in order to be a critical and quantitative thinker and solve problems in a range of fields, including education. And I could not be more grateful to have my work recognized and to have had this experience over the past two years, which has been such an exciting and rewarding one. Thank you so much for watching. Hello, my name is Gabriel Swagel, and I'm a member of the class of 2020 of Princeton's Department of Economics. Today I'm going to be presenting my senior thesis titled Segregation and Upward Mobility, Evidence from Neighborhood Tipping. So, racial and residential segregation is a defining and persistent characteristic of the United States. In his seminal book, The Truly Disadvantaged, William Julius Wilson argued that segregation creates an underclass in American society. In my thesis, I find empirical evidence that growing up in a segregated neighborhood substantially reduces upward socioeconomic mobility. There's a large literature on the causes and consequences of residential segregation, yet little is known about the long-run income consequences of experiencing segregation during childhood. There are two reasons why estimating this effect is so difficult. First, measuring upward mobility has been difficult. There's a long running debate in the literature on how to best capture intergenerational income mobility in the data that's available to researchers. 
even with the use of administrative data sets, increasingly making it possible to estimate upper mobility, establishing causality is difficult. Because people live in neighborhoods non-randomly, segregation is often associated with many other societal problems. This makes it difficult to isolate the consequences of residential segregation. I solved the first issue by using new neighborhood level estimates of upper mobility from the Opportunity Insights Project. They estimate the average rank in the adulthood income, household income distribution for individuals born between 1978 to 1983, conditional on the income percentile they grew up in. Following the literature, I used these mean predicted outcomes for children whose families were in the 25th percentile to measure upper mobility. The upper mobility measures are disaggregated by race, allowing me to look at how segregation might affect whites and blacks differently. I solved the second issue by using an instrumental variable strategy based on the neighborhood tipping theory, drawing on estimates of tipping points from Card, Moss, and Rothstein. These tipping points are threshold values for neighborhood minority share, which determine demographic dynamics. When neighborhoods move past these critical points, whites flee the neighborhood, which results in segregation. And before diving into the rest of this presentation, I want to, I want to say that a full link to the paper is available on the Griswold Center website in case you want more details than anything I present here. Additionally, my email is here in the, in the slides and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. The neighborhood tipping model says that as low minority shares, neighborhood demographics will evolve continuously. However, if a neighborhood passes a certain threshold minority share, the neighborhood will tip and all the whites will leave the neighborhood, leading to segregation. These tipping dynamics were originally presented in a series of papers in the early 1970s by Thomas Schelling. In my paper, I worked through a model of neighborhood dynamics in which the segregationary tipping occurs even though whites prefer to live in integrated neighborhoods. There's also empirical evidence of this discontinuity, which is provided in the 2008 paper by David Card, Alex Moss, and Jesse Rothstein. They provide evidence that neighborhoods in the United States exhibit tipping. They estimate the location of these tipping points for over 100 metropolitan areas across the United States in 1980. In the graph to the left, I've plotted census tract demographic dynamics to showcase the evidence of these tipping dynamics. On the x-axis is the tract's 1980 minority share in relation to its estimated tipping point. An x value of 10 here means that the tract has a minority share which is 10 percentage points past its estimated tipping point. On the y-axis is the 1990 minority share. The solid red lines our linear regressions fit on either side of zero, on either side of the tipping point, in other words. We see a big discontinuity between the endpoints of these best fit lines at the tipping point, at zero on the x-axis. Tracks just past their tipping point in 1980 have substantially higher 1990 minority shares than tracks just below the tipping point, which is empirical evidence of the tipping model. Obviously, this graph does not control for the city each tract is in, so the discontinuity remains significant after controlling for that, as I will show in a couple of slides. The key takeaway from all of this is that two neighborhoods which are on either side of the tipping point are going to be similar in many respects, except that by virtue of being across this threshold value, one neighborhood will experience segregationary white flight. From this insight, I present a novel extension of the tipping model, which uses tipping in a regression discontinuity design to examine the effects of segregation on long-term income and upward mobility. Making comparisons between neighborhoods which are on either side of the tipping point across the United States, we can get a plausibly causal estimate of the effect of segregation. I formalized these comparisons using a two-stage these squares empirical framework. In the parlance of applied econometrics, what I'm doing here is I'm using the discontinuity at the tipping point as an instrument for future neighborhood minority share to identify the causal effects of segregation on upward mobility. The interpretation of the estimated effect of the 1990 minority share that comes out of the model is worth explaining in more detail. Two stage least squares estimates what's called the local average treatment effect. In this context, the local average treatment effect 
is the effect on upper mobility of a higher minority share for those tracts whose minority shares were the result of neighborhood tipping from a mostly white tract to a high concentration of minorities. This interpretation of the results is why the 1990 minority share is an apt proxy for measuring residential segregation in this context. The coefficient on it is a two-stage least squares model, and specifically in the second stage there, and the estimates that come out of it, measures the, up, the impact on upward mobility of experienced segregationary forces of white flight and minority clustering. As with any non-experimental estimation strategy, this approach requires some assumptions. In this case, the key assumption is that neighborhoods end up on either side of the tipping point in 1980 due to reasons which are unrelated to the potential for upper mobility of the residents of those neighborhoods. In the paper, I present robustness checks which examine the validity of this assumption. Here are the results of estimating the two-stage least squares model that I presented on the previous slide. The first column is the formal regression of the tipping graph that I showed a couple of slides ago, this time controlling for the city the neighborhood is in. As you can see, the coefficient on the discontinuity indicator past tip point is highly significant, and we don't need to worry about any weak instrument problems here. The second set of columns report the results of the, two, of the full two-stage least squares model, estimating the effect of segregation on upward mobility. I do this separately for neighborhood measures of overall upper mobility, which pools across races, black upper mobility, and white upper mobility. Across all three models, segregation is estimated to significantly reduce upper mobility. First, looking at the model for overall upper mobility in column two, we see that growing up in a neighborhood with a 10 percentage point my higher minority share, which results from segregation, is associated with a four percentile reduction in household income rank. Let's now turn to columns three and four, which estimate the model separately for blacks and whites. The coefficient on minority share is significantly more negative in the model for white upward mobility than black upward mobility. This would suggest that while growing up in a neighborhood which experiences segregationary tipping is harmful for both black and white children, the marginal effect of a higher minority share from segregation is worse for white children who grow up in that tipped neighborhood than for black children. It's clear that there are other dimensions of welfare for which segregation is more detrimental for black children. This analysis does not capture these effects, considering only the income on adulthood household income rank. Nonetheless, this result is surprising. Although the absolute level of upper mobility is measured to be lower for blacks than whites, growing up in a neighborhood which experienced a segregationary tipping is estimated to be worse for up white upper mobility. What could explain this? In the paper, I offer two possible explanations for this surprising finding. First, I note that this result is consistent with the minority enclave hypothesis. This hypothesis argues that individuals may benefit from a peer group which is more like them. Black children in tip neighborhoods that experienced white flight and avoidance may have had some offsetting benefit from these clustered peer effects. Meanwhile, white children who remained in these neighborhoods were increasingly surrounded by neighbors who were of a different racial group than them. Thus, these white children would have received no mitigating benefits from the segregation, which might have counteracted some of the overwhelmingly harmful effects. However, this difference may also be the result of statistical bias resulting from selection, in that whites who remain in tip neighborhoods are different from those who do not. Given that tipping is driven mostly by white flight, if the white families who did not leave tip neighborhoods, these white stayers, had lower underlying potential for upward mobility, the two-stage least squares models would overstate the effect of segregation on white upward mobility. A potential avenue for future research would be to use individual level data to examine whether selection in the composition of these white stairs affects these results. Overall, it is clear that segregation reduces upward socioeconomic mobility. And importantly, segregation reduces upward mobility for all groups. To better contextualize just how harmful segregation is, 
I take the effect of a 10 percentage point increase in neighborhood minority share and translate this effect into dollars. Consider that the average low-income child in a neighborhood that was below its 1980 tipping point has a mean predicted outcome of the 46th percentile of income. This percentile corresponds to a household income of $37,600. A four percentile reduction in income rank to the 42nd percentile translates to a $4,500 loss in annual household income. This loss is equivalent to a 12% reduction in annual income. To make up for a loss of this magnitude, we require a sum equivalent to nearly 70% of the maximum earned income tax credit payment. To summarize, in my paper, I show how racial residential segregation inhibits upward socioeconomic mobility. Growing up in segregated neighborhoods substantially reduces adulthood income. These results suggest that policies which aim to directly reduce residential segregation would have large benefits. I've highlighted three potential policy options here. The first would be to give individuals in high minority share neighborhoods housing vouchers to move into mainly white neighborhoods in a manner similar to the Moving to Opportunity Project. The second would be to build and incentivize affordable housing in gentrified mainly white neighborhoods. Finally, increasing investment into schools in neighborhoods with lots of minorities may encourage integration by causing white families to move into the neighborhood. An important avenue for future research is to evaluate the efficacy and efficiency of such policies in promoting the important goals of racial integration and upward mobility. I'd like to take a moment to express my gratitude to a couple of people who are, who are very helpful in putting together this work. I'm very grateful to Leah Bustan, Judith Hellerstein, and Philip Swagel for helpful comments and discussion. Thank you to the team at Opportunity Insights and David Card, Alexandre Moss, and Jesse Rothstein for making their data available online. I'm also especially grateful to my advisor, Owen Zadar, for his input throughout the development of this thesis. Thank you to the Griswold Center and Professor Kuziemko and Sims for organizing this presentation series, and to Dana Molina for helpful comments on this presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Yustra, and I'm here to present on my senior thesis. So thank you so much for virtually having me uh, today, I will go ahead and share my screen. And as you can see, the, uh, my thesis tackles the question of whether immigration and enforcement policies can induce labor market discrimination, and if so, how does that manifest in the labor market? Um, I've used Secure Communities, which is a deportation program instated back in 2008, to narrow down this question as I tackle it. And I've done this with the help of Professor Orly Ashenfelter, who's been a great mentor to me. Um, before starting off um, with this question, I thought I'd first walk you through why I wanted to tackle it in the first place and relate it back to some recent and relevant issues in the U.S. nowadays. Um, these are some of many headlines that caught my attention in the past two or three years, and these all revolve around the uh, immigration agenda of the Trump administration and whether these immigration policies benefited or adversely affected the American labor force. And so I thought I'd chip in and uh, contribute to the literature of the immigration labor economics and um, look at deportation programs and see how they can answer this question one way or the other. And so my thesis uh, can answer actually a broad spectrum of questions and it can go from very specific question, which is the effects of secure communities on the annual earnings of Hispanic men in the US to a little bit more of a broad question about the market spillover effects of enforcement pol immigration policies on American citizens in general, and how does labor market discrimination fit, um, fit in um, these effects and these observed results. And just to give you a little bit of background about the deportation program that I'm using, it was instated back in 2008 by ICE, and it targeted undocumented Hispanics as they constituted the vast majority of the, the total deportations, which were over 680,000. Um, and the way it works is that the local authorities partner with ICE by sending them the fingerprints of their arrestee to see if there's any match with an alien profile. And if there is, ICE goes ahead and detains that person 
for 48 hours to see if they need to deport them or not. And um, this program actually worked out very nicely for me as an economist, as there was many, many variations in its implementation. It was not a nationwide program. It was implemented by county. And so many counties implemented it, implemented it in 2008, some in 2009, some in 2010 into its full implementation in 2012. But between 2008 and 2012, there's actually many uh, variations that I can use to use a difference in difference method to construct my treatment and control group. And so my treatment group would consist of Hispanic men. These are citizens and legal immigrants, so people who have a legal status in the US who work in secure communities counties. And so my control group would actually be Hispanic men who work in non-secure communities counties. And this worked out well for my methodology. And so I tested for pre-parallel trends. I controlled for individual and county level characteristics. And if you'd like to see my full regression, please refer to the thesis that is attached to this presentation. And so with this methodology, I'll go right ahead and dive into the results. The main outcome that I looked at was the annual earnings of Hispanic men, again, citizens and legal immigrants. And these um, are people that are supposedly not directly affected by this program. And so these are spillover effects that we're um, observing. And I actually observed a negative decrease in their annual earnings of about 3.4%. This was statistically significant at the 1% level. And for my thesis, I made a very crucial assumption at the beginning, was it, which is there's a substitution between the jobs of Hispanic undocumented workers and those of Hispanic citizens and legal immigrants. And so, for example, if um, in Orange County, California, many undocumented workers were deported back to their home country, the jobs and the vacancies that arise from this um, deportation will create job opportunities for Hispanic citizens and legal immigrants who will now see a more demand for their work, which technically should um, allow them to um, witness a, a um, increase in their annual earnings, but we actually see the opposite. And I attribute this negative effect to labor market discrimination. I elaborate on this again in my conceptual framework section in my thesis. I use the Becker employer case model, so please refer to that if you want more details. Um, but, but basically, I hypothesize about the prejudice that employers might have against this ethnic group, and this prejudice would be fueled by the implementation of this program. So if I'm an employer in Orange County and I see that they're deporting all these undocumented immigrants that are mainly Hispanic and I have prejudice against Hispanics, um, this deportation program suddenly fueled this prejudice and, um, and I actually can act on it because local authorities are also doing something similar so I'd actually avoid this uh, Hispanic ethnic group in its, in its totality with their the worker has a legal status or not so maybe i will fire my hispanic workers or i will not employ them or i will lower their wages their tips and so on um and so because of that they would see a decrease in their annual earnings another hypothesis is that and we've seen this actually with 9 11 is that because and i've talked about this in my thesis as well there's many reports of violence and discrimination in the workplace Hispanic men uh, in the US would actually avoid to go to work or would not work as many hours as they would um, just to, uh, to, stay, to lay low and avoid any discrimination in the, market, uh, in the labor market. We've seen this again with 9-11 with the Muslim community and how they avoided to go to work um, because they've seen many you know, violent encounters in the workplace. Even Sikhs who technically are not from the Muslim faith, but because of their appearance, many um, assume that they do belong to the Muslim faith. And so they um, were affected as well. So this is what we're kind of seeing here as well. Although Hispanic men uh, in the US that are, have a legal status are not affected by this program, we see that they've also actually um, encountered a decrease in their annual earnings. And I attribute this to the labor market discrimination um, framework that I laid out in my thesis. And so just for robustness checks, I looked at gender differences between men and women. And as you see here, the effect on annual earnings of Hispanic men is a little bit bigger than that of Hispanic women. But when I tested for the statistical um, significance between this difference and the coefficients, um, I didn't find any um, statistical significance. But it was interesting to see. I did the same thing for geographic heterogeneity. We see here that men who work in counties who 
um, in counties in border states, so that would be California and um, Texas, for example, we see that the um, effect is a little bit bigger than those who work in New York, for example. And I thought that this would be attributed to the fact that because they're close to the US-Mexico border, that maybe those um, that prejudice against Hispanics is a little bit more pronounced in those states. Uh, but again, I didn't find any statistically significant difference between um, the two. And so just to wrap up, um, I think this is one of the most important parts of this thesis is to kind of look at these results and think about how we can implement them um, in, by looking at, in looking at policies and specifically immigration policies nowadays. Now we see that this policy that was aimed at reducing the number of undocumented immigrants had an adverse effect on the American population, specifically the annual earnings of um, the Americans that identify as Hispanic or Latino, but that have a legal status, whether that's a citizenship, a green card or a work visa, for example. And so, first of all, it asks a, poses a question that is very important to tackle, which is whether there's a complementarity or substitution between American and immigrant jobs. Um, and this is important because this would help us explain why there's an increase or a decrease in their annual earnings or their wage or their hours worked after the implementation of such policy. And once we've tackled that question, we want to see whether, for example, bills like Hire American uh, protect American jobs. We've seen here that there's some sort of substitution, there's some sort of relationship between the undocumented workers and the Hispanic legal um, workers in the United States and how employers might perceive them as the same um, in a tense political climate such as that of secure communities. So how do we remedy externalities such as the one observed here, the spillover effect of the decrease in annual earnings of Hispanic men, how do we remedy such an externality um, when we implement immigration policies um, such as this one that targets undocumented immigrants? So I think these are all relevant questions to look at before implementing such policy. And when looking at this debate, um, this ongoing and very interesting debate, in my opinion, about whether um, immigration policies protect American jobs or not. And so with that thought, I'd leave you for other presentations. Thank you so much for listening to me and uh, have a good day.